I'm Peter Leitert, president of the Theophilus Institute, and I'm here today with James Rogers, who is an associate professor of political science at Texas A&M University. Uh, Jim is an old friend of uh, Theophilus, an old friend of ours. He's here in Birmingham to start a, a new program and project for Theophilus, and so this video is an opportunity for uh, Jim to talk about his work and also to talk about the project that we're getting started. We're calling it the uh, Civitas Group, and it's dedicated to trying to address some of the complicated political and economic issues that have uh, particularly grown up in the uh, in contemporary American politics, and particularly really global politics. Uh, questions about nationalism, question about liberalism, and whether we're entering a post-liberal age, what that means to be post-liberal, questions about global capitalism, uh, and the Civitas Project, the Civitas Group, is a private discussion group that is trying to address some of these questions from a particularly theopolitan angle. And what that means is that we're trying to highlight the role of the church in a society. And we're also trying to think through these things uh, from a biblical perspective. And uh, Jim uh, proposed this uh, idea of a, of a project like this to Theophilus. Uh, and Jim is chairing our meeting. So uh, I wanted to introduce him to uh, our Theophilus audience and give him a chance to introduce his himself and uh, his work. So uh, thanks, Jim, for sure, being with us to today, and, and thank you very much for the proposal of this project and for uh, your leadership in getting, getting it underway. Before we get into the specifics of the Civitas Project, the Civitas Group, um, why don't you say a little bit about your work as a political scientist? Well, I'm a... Uh, by training an applied game theorist, uh, which is not as fun as it sounds. Uh, <laughs> Ping pong mostly. Yeah, that's right, right, uh, tic-tac-toe. <laughs> um, uh, game theory is something that comes out of economics, although it's applied uh, in political science uh, and some sociology and philosophy uh, that deals with strategic interaction between individuals. Uh, um, and so it's usually uh, mathematical modeling. Uh, I apply it uh, to study uh, institutions and what I call sort of classic questions in uh, uh, interacting institutions. Uh, uh, much of my work deals with the, the interaction of uh, courts and legislatures, uh, sometimes in conversation with an executive or the public, uh, sometimes not uh, uh, a good little bit of my uh, work deals with the interaction of bicameral chambers in a legislature. Uh, I grew up in Nebraska, the unicameral legislature, and so it was always an open question in Nebraska <laughs> that was not an open question anywhere else in the United States. Uh, and so it was a puzzle, why this second chamber? Uh, uh, and so that's my you know professional work, such as it is, is this intersection of uh, law uh, economics or rational choice models, and usually, or oftentimes, uh, historical background as well. And you've just come back from several years in Qatar. Yes. Did you get a Texas A&M branch there? That's right. Yeah, we spent six years in Qatar uh, at the branch campus there. It's in an area called uh, Education City. And in addition to Texas A&M, uh, Cornell University, Georgetown, uh, Carnegie Mellon and Northwestern and Virginia Commonwealth have uh, campuses or buildings all within about half a mile of each other. Uh, uh, they really encourage main campus faculty to teach so that it's a well-integrated unit. Uh, but it was an uh, uh, incredibly interesting time. I just finished up as department head at Texas A&M. Uh, we intended, we went over intending to spend three years teaching in Qatar, uh, but for different reasons. My son wanted to graduate from the embassy school there, uh, and we were having to take enough time that both my wife and I uh, said, you know, it wasn't difficult to, to decide to stay. We stayed for six full years. You're in reintegrating into the States currently. Back yes, that's right. Back into right. your normal spot at, uh, in College Station. Right. Uh, so you're you're one of these, uh, one of these secular social scientists that we hear so much about uh, that's committed to a reductionist view of uh, human action and human behavior. Uh, is that is that what I hear you saying when you talk about your work as a game theorist? Well, you, you may hear that, Peter, but it's not what I said. So it's, uh, uh, as, uh, 
Uh, I mean, there's certainly parts of, of a little conversation that we can have. Uh, there are criticisms of the sort of modeling that I do, oftentimes coming from conservatives, uh, because uh, they impute uh, far more ontology to the models than is justified. Uh, the modeling that I do, I, I analogize it to a uh, map. Uh, if you were to open a map of Alabama out and go, you know, uh, here's Montgomery and, you know, here are the, the hills and so forth, and I went, no, it's not. That's a completely unrealistic uh, projection of the state of Alabama. Uh, 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 you'd look at me and go, well, of course it is. The, that was the point of actually making a map, uh, is to make it simple and accessible. Um, now, maps are useful only if they abstract away the items that you don't need to find your way uh, and include the items that you do. Uh, in mathematical, models can be done poorly, right? But when a mathematical model is done properly, uh, like a map, it abstracts away from the elements that you don't need to worry about uh, in order to understand what's going on and includes the relevant items. And we can argue about what those are. Uh, but there's nothing, I mean, it, it is unrealistic, but it's meant to be unrealistic. Just like a map is an unrealistic uh, picture of the, of the real topology that's out there. Because the real topology is too complicated to help you get from point A to point B. Yes. And for those young people out there, you might Google the word map and yes. you, could, you could find out what, what a map what a map used to be. So uh, you're a Missouri Synod Lutheran. Yes. Um, and uh, you also, in addition to your professional work in, the, in political science and economics in, this, uh, in the region of game theory, uh, you've written quite a bit on uh, trying to think through uh, political questions, legal questions from a Christian angle and trying to think through them biblically. Uh, you recently published a, uh, an essay on the Law and Liberty website about the Bible and the Nations. You, you published a, uh, an overlapping essay at the Theopolis uh, website a couple months ago as part of the Theopolis conversation. And tell me how that, how you think about the interaction between your work with Scripture and trying to think through those questions scripturally and the professional social science work. Well, uh, I mean, again, it's it's. It's certainly all unified. Uh, the uh, the questions that I work through professionally are largely questions. I mean, are, are intended to be predictive, uh, which is to understand how things work. Uh, the goals or the purposes that the actors have in those models uh, is is given at the outset, is in an assumption of then sort of seeing how they work themselves out. And so in a sense, the way that I think about it is my professional work deals with uh, prudential aspects of the reality that is out there. Uh, as Cornelius Van Til said, right, there's nothing more scientific about counting a field of cows than of looking through a microscope. Um, and that's what, you know, I think about the, the, the modeling. Uh, it's really the, the only reason, I mean, it, it looks scientific, which is, uh, you know, neither here nor there, because I use uh, equations or math, but we could, you know, just talk about it using words. Uh, and everybody would think it's uh, uh, straightforward. Uh, but uh, math is just an efficient language uh, that actually helps us to think through things without some uh, some of the ambiguities, uh, el elocutionary act potential that the English language has in other languages as well. Uh, and so I think of it as as a as a singular weave. Uh, and you know, so we, we can talk about. Uh, Cheap talk models in the scripture. Uh, mm -hmm. and Jesus says, "Is it harder for me to say, uh, I'll pick up your pallet and walk, or your sins are forgiven?" Mm -hmm. uh, we could model that uh, the, the strategic context between him and his listeners, particularly the Pharisee uh, 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 hearers. Uh, not, not that there would be any particular insight provided, but, mm -hmm. but it's, the, it's the same phenomenon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, a convenient way of trying to grapple with certain elements of um, reality. Uh, as I mentioned at the outset, you, you uh, 
proposed uh, the creation of this discussion group that uh, we're kicking off this weekend, the Civitas group. And uh, that came out of, partly out of your sense of where contemporary politics, uh, the, uh, I don't know if you would say crisis or the, the uh, at least the, the uh, uh, tumultuous character of contemporary politics, and also uh, kind of uh, uh, confusion among Christians about how to respond to that. Uh, what were some of the questions that you uh, saw being posed by the contemporary situation you were trying to? Well, there's certainly. I mean, I mean, part of it is the nature of of uh, the, the current times, uh, and there are there are certain facts that that everybody seems to agree on, uh, certain outcomes, uh, but but. People, both academic and non, uh, sort of there's too many. There, there are more theories than there are facts, and so the question is, what's going on? Uh, and these facts extend from anywhere from uh, the 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 fact that the cost of cross national capital and labor mobility has declined hugely over the last. 30 to 40 years. As a result, we see uh, capital movement and labor movements across national borders in ways that we scarcely thought, uh, even at the heyday of immigration, uh, you know, almost a century ago in the U.S. or other places. Um, uh, and those have effects on wages and working conditions in, in uh, both countries or in all countries. Uh, in the U.S. and in some Western countries, uh, 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 they're called deaths of despair. Uh, There's a particularly prominent among white men, uh, but uh, uh, white women and actually uh, uh, older men of all sort, uh, although usually health indicators for both African American and Hispanic uh, men and women seem still to be increasing. Uh, but by death of despair, the the uh, uh, academics meant uh, both suicide, but also suicide-like uh, deaths, uh, increase in deaths from alcohol poisoning and from drug abuse. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, now, again, we're not talking about 25-year-olds in a car accident. Mm -hmm. We're talking about 50-year-olds, uh, uh, and uh, uh, the it's. You know, while the data are clear, uh, it's unclear why men, uh, but also women, uh, but why individuals in this age range uh, would be, why their death rates are increasing, uh, literally increasing, uh, while for the last century, maybe even more, they've been on the decline. Um, and, you know, again, there are many theories why this may be, you know, one that both uh, the scholars and, and uh, certainly some prominent conservatives have pointed to is the, the changing nature of work in the United States, uh, the stress of global competition, you know, potentially markets. I mean, uh, it, it could be that. Others, you know, point to uh, spiritual uh, conditions. Uh, that uh, both uh, the vertical and the horizontal connection uh, between individuals with God, uh, uh, but also with one another at a church and, and so forth, have broken down, uh, arguably. Um, and so again, it's a it's a phenomenon that is that we can recognize, mm -hmm. uh, but it's still unclear what the causes are, the theoretical connections. Mm -hmm. uh, Certainly, with the election of President Trump uh, and the, the rise of populism, uh, it's you know we can talk about immigration on an economic front, uh, but in addition to the economic front, there's been an aspect of talking about the the social impact of of immigration, mm -hmm. of the changing nature of communities. Uh, uh, and how that sort of wraps itself in. And again, oftentimes I've, I've found that, that uh, people sort of mix them all up um, and move from one to one without sort of sitting down and just thinking through, you know, rigorous or even semi-rigorous fashion, 
uh, what's going on in each of these different areas, and there are just so many moving parts mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that, uh, I mean, perhaps it's just uh, very self-indulgent on my part. <laughs> uh, uh, you've asked me to write some stuff that I have declined to do uh, because I don't feel that I have a good grip on what's going on out there. Uh, and so sort of in response to, to, to throw you a bone rather than just say no, uh, I propose this series of four seminars, uh, sort of nicely structured by Milbanks and Papp's book on the, the politics of virtue, uh, using them as, as our interlocutors, or at least our fundamental interlocutors, uh, where they split it up into uh, uh, discussions sort of four crises or four aspects of the crisis. Uh, that they call a meta crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, the one that we're talking about this weekend is in uh, uh, the crisis in capitalism or markets. Uh, then we'll talk about the crisis in democracy or politics, the crisis uh, in uh, society or solidarity, and then finally look at the interaction of all of these. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, while I hope that my questions and the text that I draw on or want to draw on to help think through these questions are questions that you and the others who are attending the seminar are asking as well. I trust that's the case. Uh, 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 really the, the, the motivating factor is to think through these things in discussion uh, with some other smart Christians uh, to sort of get a grip both on what's happening, what is causing what's happening, uh, how much we have to worry about it, and then what, if anything, uh, the church can do to respond to, to what's going on. So you're, you're just instrumentalizing Theopolis for, for uh, your own personal interests. Yeah, that's right. Trying, right. trying, to, trying to achieve... Uh, I'm treating Theopolis as a means rather than an end <laughs> right, of itself. Right. So, so. I, I'm glad we had that clarified <laughs> for the, uh, before we get started. So uh, just to step back a second, you were talking about very specific issues that... Uh, cultural, social, political issues. Uh, that's been discussed in a lot of quarters under the heading of the failure of liberalism. Yes. Uh, uh, the development of a post-liberal perspective that's coming out from different sides of the political spectrum. You have conservatives that are talking in post-liberal terms. You have people that are on the left that are talking in post-liberal terms. In some ways, something of a convergence there. But what you, part, of what you're, part of what you're talking about is trying to... Trying to kind of peel back some of the layers of those very large categories. Yes. Neoliberalism, neocapitalism. Peel back those and, and try to get down to uh, what is, as you say, what is actually going on and uh, wh what, what, is, what might be good or bad about what's going on. Uh, uh, the fact that things are changing doesn't necessarily, they're changing, That's right. doesn't necessarily mean they're changing for the worse, worst. Uh, Change can be painful, even when it's ultimately uh, change for the good. So that's you're you're looking partly for empirical kinds of um, insight into what's what's actually happening. Uh, well, something as well, and, and this is not this is not me challenging. I mean, it could be that we can figure things out. I'm also possible open to what I call the possibility of tragedy, uh, which is there are no first best outcomes uh, that. Uh, in order for uh, a, a, a fact that that many people don't know, uh, and actually some of the authors that we're reading assume hasn't been the case, uh, over the last 10 to 20 years, the world has seen uh, more people uh, moving out of extreme poverty than ever before in world history. Uh, and both conservative uh, but liberal hunger groups recognize this, that there have been approximately one billion people who have moved out of extreme poverty. Extreme poverty means liber living on, depends, the definitions vary a little bit, but living on between $1.50 a day to $1.80 a day. Uh, now, moving out of extreme poverty doesn't mean that you're driving a Cadillac, mind mm -hmm. you, but it does mean that uh, you're not living at the at the edge of, of survival, um, and just the huge numbers who have moved out. Now, the question is: is is there a relationship between uh, the 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 stunning decrease 
in poverty in uh, identifiable less or developed countries and the income stagnation that we see in Western Europe and, and the United States. Uh, answering yes doesn't stipulate a policy answer on how to respond, but nonetheless it identifies a trade-off. Um, and even among Christian uh, conservatives uh, who talk about uh, 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 trying to overcome wage stagnation in the United States, there's still the question of of the trade-off. Uh, and uh, there's a, a column that I posted at the First Things website a couple of years ago. The title was, How Many Americans, How Many Foreigners is an American Worth? Mm-hmm. Uh, and implicit, uh, if in fact there's a connection, if there's a connection, implicit is that we're trading off uh, some foreign lives uh, in order to make the American middle class better off. Uh, now, setting it that way, I mean, it starts to sound like liberal guilt, which is the point, uh, because there's not a problem in principle. I feed my own family, mm-hmm. uh, and not so much another family, mm-hmm. uh, although in buying things, they you know, can provide for themselves. Uh, and so having communities that we prefer uh, is not intrinsically evil from a Christian perspective. At the same time, right, at some point there comes a tipping point uh, where you go, just because somebody's an American, does that mean 10 people uh, in India should be living in extreme poverty? 20 people. You know, is there a number there where you go, uh, you know, somebody earning the same amount of money uh, several years in a row is worth uh, 100 million Indians moving out of extreme poverty? Uh, or not. I mean, right, but the point is there's a trade off there. And the idea of tragedy is particularly then if we link the, the limitations on. Uh, on what's happening in the the American or European work context to increase in stress uh, and the death of despair. Uh, It it is a tragic outcome in the sense that uh, we cannot achieve the first best world. Uh, Mm -hmm. There's no utopia out there. Mm -hmm. And and either, uh, uh, at least a possibility, that uh, we'll need to continue with Americans suffering in this way Mm -hmm. or that non-Americans will need to suffer but we cannot alleviate suffering of both. Mm-hmm. And that's a, uh, that's a tragic outcome because they're incommensurable. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of the things you uh, mentioned in the previous answer was the role that the church might play in addressing some of these questions. That's that's definitely part of the interest that Theopolis has in this whole project. Um, one of the frustrations that I have, I'm, I'm kind of a, I'm a Johnny One Note in my critiques of various analyses of contemporary America, which, uh, with very with very few exceptions, marginalized the church as as an important player in the current political situation. There are there are some notable exceptions. Tim Carney's book Alienated America is a, a is a, uh, an important exception to that it talks about the need to restore civil society, but then adds in America civil society is the church. Yeah, and the the empty church is as much a sign of the decline of Middle America as the as the closed factory. Um, and I know that's an important part of what you're yeah. interested in, trying to see, trying to think through these questions with a, a recognition of the church's uniqueness and centrality as a community in the, in the world. Well, I think I mean, there's enough blame to go around. So, <laughs> because, uh, uh, I think that the well, to say that it's the ecclesiastical weakness of the church. Uh, is to suggest that the church has become ecclesiastically weak only recently. Uh, I tend to think that in the U.S. in particular, uh, uh, for different reasons, that the that the church has historically been ecclesiastically weak, uh, uh, both as a result of denominational competition uh, as well as really just... Uh, very weak ecclesiastical ecclesial theology uh, that uh, I mean even if the confessions don't uh, officially confirm it uh, sort of develop for different reasons uh, here in the United States um, 
uh, in the the revolutions that we've seen in social life over the last generation, uh, much of it dealing with uh, uh, relationships between the sexes, uh, relationships between uh, parents and children, uh, 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 interaction with the public sphere, uh, First Amendment, the privacy rights from the 14th Amendment, uh, is uh, uh, the motif of equality that is has always been, I mean, a part of the American narrative, uh, but has been running rampant, uh, both socially and legally. Uh, I mean, you know, it's almost impossible to identify a particular starting point, but certainly the 1960s were a changing point, uh, and the veritable revolution that we've seen in the in the last several decades. What it is, or at least a part of what it is, is, I mean, the, the 25 cent term is uh, social semiotics, is the, the, the life of the imagination that we live in, uh, the metaphors that we live in. Uh, uh, Charles Taylor calls it what the social imaginary, I believe. Uh, uh, so, for example, Tocqueville in Democracy in America talks about the way that people in aristocracy just conceptualize things differently than people in democracy. That people in aristocracies, as a result of just living in this context, just naturally think in terms of hierarchies mm -hmm. uh, and find that natural. Uh, in democracies, on the other hand, Tocqueville says uh, uh, they just naturally are suspect of hierarchies or differences mm -hmm. uh, and naturally think in terms of equality. And it's not simply in those narrow areas, uh, but they think uh, analogically, right, from one sphere to another. And so it flavors, as it were, the entire society. Uh, Tocqueville also talks about how uh, Americans, we like to think of ourselves and we like others to think that what Americans value most is liberty. But in one of the more controversial statements, uh, Tocqueville says that uh, uh, in a situation of equality, Americans will prefer liberty, more liberty over less. But if there's other, ever uh, uh, a choice between equality and liberty, Americans will always choose equality first uh, over liberty. Uh, and I suspect that's true. And the question is, where does that come from? Um, and, you know, we, we can't solve that problem uh, uh, today. Uh, but part of where that comes from is uh, uh, the way that the church conceives of herself um, uh, and her unwillingness to make differences or distinctions. Uh, and so... You know, among the believing church, uh, those who uh, refuse to baptize infants, for example, uh, really just, I mean, have a Lockean view of the church, uh, have uh, social contract theory theology of church community, uh, and as a result, it's liberal to the core. Now, to the extent that, and I don't mean liberal like in the progressive sense, but liberal in the sense of consent being the heart of the ecclesiology. Um, and as a result, it's not a surprise that, uh, that particularly Protestants don't sort of naturally conceive of compelling arguments against uh, 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 sovereign consent uh, being the... Uh, the, the legal guiding post, uh, as uh, uh, Justice Kennedy wrote in uh, uh, South Planned Parenthood of Southeast uh, Pennsylvania, uh, that one's uh, notion of the universe, mm -hmm. uh, I call it the California rationale, mm -hmm. of, uh, of one's identity is constructed solely by oneself, mm -hmm. and that's the core of 14th Amendment and liberty. Which, of course, is nonsense, right? I mean, if, if we're talking about historical meaning within any parameter, mind you. 
Um, um, but that notion really is at the heart of much of American Christianity, uh, and as a result, we are unable to think ourselves out of, I mean, basically it's the world instructing the church rather than church instructing the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and however it pans out, what the, what the need is, is for the church to construct a thick enough world, and I believe that comes supernaturally through the sacraments of baptism and the Lord's Supper most particularly, uh, but in those it's not simply a union with Jesus Christ, although it's certainly and fundamentally that, but it's a connection with one another. Mm -hmm. uh, as Paul says, we are part of one another in these things, and so the only place where, where true ontological unity comes, the only place where there's the solution to the social problem of the one and the many uh, is in the church and paradigmatically in the sacraments that the church practices. Uh, and that's the only solution ultimately uh, to loneliness and alienation because our loneliness and alienation derive from our alienation from God and therefore our alienation from one another. Uh, and the, the fact that we think of churches as voluntary organizations uh, that we dip into church on Sunday morning um, and, uh, uh, you know, uh, paste the smile on our faces and mm -hmm. say hello mm -hmm. and then go and do what else we want to do for the rest of the week. Uh, whereas the church is our fundamental community. Uh, in the uh, post that I uh, wrote for uh, Law and Liberty, uh, the end line uh, derived from the scriptures is... Uh, the church is my family, the church is my city, the church is my nation. Uh, uh, and we look at all these hard sayings of Jesus and of mm -hmm. Paul uh, where he indicates this, and we can confess that. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, uh, I don't think that our practice belies uh, uh, our confession. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so I think it's, you know, ultimately when we scratch these problems, it's fundamentally a, a, an, an issue of the church and of the, the really weak ecclesiologies that, that, that we have here in the United States. So that's the perspective. You're very much, you're very much singing the Theophilus tune there, uh, as you know. Yes, right. uh, that's the perspective that the Civitas group is going to be trying to articulate and work through uh, and try to do it as you uh, under your guidance, we're going to try to do it uh, with a lot of attention to uh, what, as you said, what's actually going on and trying to figure out how the church actually addresses these kinds of questions, uh, not in a kind of abstract and global theoretical way, but in, in more concrete way. So uh, we're very thankful for your involvement with us. Uh, thanks for your time this afternoon. Right, thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity.